Hello. This is a recording of a Winter Heritage Open Days event live streamed in 2020. We hope you enjoy it. So statues, big issue with statues. Um, statues are problematic and this is what we're going to be looking at today. Um, here we have Lenin dressed up as Darth Vader. This photograph was taken in Ukraine in 2011 and this goes to show the kind of issues that we have here that we'll be discussing. This is at once an issue of nation making and nation unmaking and remaking. Lenin, in a sense, that communism is the ideology that glued together the former USSR. Statues were established across the USSR to kind of act as a coherent knitting together ideology for, for the USSR and the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and we sort of saw the, the, the constituent states fall apart, the, the, these, these new states had to find their own meanings, they had to find their own identities. And as time has gone on, these original statues of Lenin have become problematic and we'll return to this one later. Um, here you can see in 2011, Lenin was, was dressed up as Darth Vader and the Russians didn't like it. Um, this is the problem with statues and we'll be looking at this whole series of issues with contested commemoration. This is what statues are, the material culture of commemoration, making memory material. And the point that I've made in my um, overview of this talk and the point of, that I'm going to make again here is really, really crucial that when one disposes of a statue, when one destroys a statue, attacks a statue, you're not erasing history you're recreating history, that the whole act of doing this is part of the biography of that statue, the whole kind of long trace of history. And statues are archeology, span statues are artifacts. Uh, you know, this is the important thing. They're, they're not history in themselves. They are pieces of material culture. It's just that they're imbued with meaning. And that's our starting point. Now, you know, aficionados of the Simpsons here will remember what happened when Bart, for a dare, removed the head from Jebediah Springfield, the statue of Jebediah Springfield. Um, it, it, it unleashed all forces of chaos. And although this is a bit of a lighthearted uh, way into our debate, um, this tweet from June of this year, um, again, lighthearted sort of, uh, sort of take on it, but it, it shows the importance of statues and how the statue issue has become embedded in our cultural lives now. Um, this relates to the beheading of the uh, statue of Christ Christopher Columbus in Boston in the United States. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an interesting take. Now, just to sort of start off by not looking at a Western statue at all, but we're going to go to Africa and we're going to think of an ethnographic example. We're going to think of an example of how um, we can look at statues from a kind of slightly different manner. And this is what we call a Bakongo Nkondi, or fetish statue. Now the Bakongo people live in central southwest Africa. It's the sort of Congo Basin area. It's a huge, huge country. And they have a tradition here of what we call making Nkisi statues, which are statues that are imbued with power. And Nkondi are specialist statues. Now the term Nkondi means the hunter and here these statues are hunters of evil spirits and bad luck and these statues aren't just made by any old artisan they're made by a specific category of individual within the Congo society called the Naganga. Naganga would be a wise person, a cunning person. Um, you don't use the term witch doctor anymore. It is, is more to do with someone who has control of magical powers and they often make them on the edges of the villages. And, and these Nkondis are invested with a huge amount of power. And to hammer in the nails, the act is called the Koma Nloka, is to hammer in a curse and to, to awaken the latent power of the statue. And if you look in the middle there, there's a sort of ovoid um, space on the, on the stomach. In this recess, the, the, there are what we call belongo or medicinal plants and other additives that are put in there to give this what we call a fetish figure magic. And this is what we call it. This is a very, very powerful statue. This statue has power. It has been invested by power. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that the, the importance of statues is not a Western phenomenon. It is, it is long lived, as we shall see. 
And as this fetish statue shows, and all of the statues that we'll be looking at here to some extent are fetish statues that you, you, you add power to them. Um, we add our own symbolism and our own meanings to statues. We give them meaning, we give them importance and we give them power. And the um, next slide here is a, a reinterpretation of the um, Nkisi statue by uh, the artist Karen Seneferu. And this is a techno Kisi. And here we have a mobile phone added on into the stomach area. And it, it, it's the same thing, it's the same idea. It's, it's, giving this, it's giving this statue a lot of importance and it's giving the statue power and power to do things. And as I say, this, we're looking at the, the ph phenomenon of statues and contested statues within a global perspective. And it makes sense to start from a non-Western viewpoint where arguably we can find huge numbers and huge examples of statues that have an innate power. And this is, this is our jumping off point. Now, th the whole idea of, of destruction of statues or what we call iconoclasm um, is not new. We can go back into ancient Egypt and you can find examples of post-mortem um, pharaonic um, readaptation of, of statues and so forth. Statues of rulers were broken after they died, they were destroyed, they were buried, they were reused, they weren't kept in a pristine state. Within the context of Rome we call this damnatio memoriae, the sort of a post-mortem condemnation of uh, memory. You can find it in the second century CE Severan tombs in Rome, but they're paintings, those, those tomb paintings, and they show physical pictures have been rubbed out, people have been erased post-mortem, their identities have been taken away, their identities have been stolen. In this case here, what we have in this example here from the, the, the Archaeological Museum in Parma in Italy is a second, sorry, is a, is a mid first century CE um, representation of formerly the Emperor Caligula, who, as, as many of you may know, was, um, had, a, had a reputation for wild partying and, and madness as well. Um, he, his statue was subsequently re reworked by um, his successor Claudius in the mid first century. But there are many examples of statues being destroyed, for example, um, maybe not destroyed, but sort of uh, taken and, and placed in places where they weren't meant to be seen. There's the head of Hadrian that was thrown in the River Thames. There was the statue of the third century um, ruler Pertinax at Lullingstone Villa in Kent that was uh, modified, facially modified. So, so we, have, we have in the classical period, moving on from ancient Egypt to the classical period, um, this concept of destruction of um, statues and removal of statues that weren't favoured anymore. A very, very infamous case of um, iconoclasm or statue removal in a very extreme form happened in March 2001 in Afghanistan with the destruction of the 6th century Bamiyan Buddhas. Now Afghanistan, this, this, this bit of Afghanistan lay across the old silk routes that stretched from Shan in western China to Aleppo in Syria and it was the route through which silk came um, historically into Europe and the whole of the silk roots effectively at one stage were the, the, the main religion silk roots was Buddhism and here in Bamiyan what you have here is actually a Buddhist monastery these are windows in the rock face. The issue with these statues relates not to political issues that you know we, in ancient Rome the issue was probably a sort of political or familial or relating to the imperial family the destruction of the statues here it's more of an overt religious issue because Afghanistan in March 2001 um, was under the control of the Taliban um, and there was a very sort of um, fundamentalist Islamic stance here and the issue here is that historically Islam has frowned upon the depiction of human beings and especially the depictions of deities there are you know, many, many cases, for example, of the um, reconversion and, and re or destruction of churches in northeastern Africa, for example, in what we call Nubia in northern Sudan, 
during the medieval period where um, Muslim incomers, you can see in some of the, the plaster paintings and churches in Nubia have removed the eyes, for example, of um, saints and so forth. So, so iconoclasm also works within a religious context too. Um, and this is what's happened here. Now, the slide on the left hand side, just to sort of talk a little bit about um, preservation and heritage management shows potentially the, the perspective that's being taken by heritage professionals at the moment is it, it may actually be possible to reconstruct the Bamiyan Buddhas, but they were they were blown up into small pieces. There was a, it was a, it was a really destructive job that was undertaken here by the, by the um, Taliban. So I've given you some context here, um, just to sort of bring us into a sort of a more modern discussion now. And what we're going to think of here is the um, commemoration in a more ephemeral kind of sense. And here are two shrines that we find within London. I call it the London Memory Scape for a reason. And the London Memory Scape here is, um, relates very, very strongly to statues, commemorative practices and so forth. And these are two very informal forms of commemorative practice, one of which involves a statue and one of which doesn't. On the left hand side is the shrine to Mark Bolan on Barnes Common. Now Mark Bolan was killed here in a, in a car crash and over time a shrine has, has built up. It's a very informal shrine. It's a, it's a shrine that starts off ephemeral and then takes on a degree of materiality. On the right hand side, a picture taken in September um, of, of 1997 after the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. And these were the floral tributes that were left outside Kensington Palace, a very ephemeral form of commemoration. Um, so you can see that commemoration works on a number of levels. We don't have to have statues to actually memorialize and commemorate people. We can do it in other ways and we can do it in ephemeral forms too. If you go to Paris, for example, the Pont d'Alma in Paris, um, you can see the shrine above the Pont d'Alma where Diana Princess of Wales died has kind of coalesced into something more material. And this is, this is an interesting theme, the idea that we move from a kind of immaterial uh, commemoration into more fixed material forms of commemoration, which leads us on to our sort of first real sort of bone of contention in terms of thinking through statues and statuary. And this isn't going to talk about a statue that was removed, quite the opposite. This is to do with a statue that was added. So another bit of our London memory scape here is Trafalgar Square in Whitehall. Now the, the aerial photograph in the left hand side here shows you um, Trafalgar Square in Whitehall leading down the top. And this really is a focal point of national memory. Trafalgar Square is where people gather on New Year's Eve. It's the focal point for demonstrations. It's a social gathering space, but it's also a memory scape as well. Because at Trafalgar Square and around Trafalgar Square, you have a series of very, very important memorials. As you come up Whitehall, one of the most important focal memorials that we have, it's not a statue, it's not a statue of a person, but it's a memorial. You see on the right hand side here is the cenotaph. The cenotaph is a good example of one of those notions of um, immaterial commemoration or, or, or should we say ephemeral commemoration made material because Luchens, when it was designed initially as a sort of temporary structure, it was wood. And it, it became so well regarded and so ingrained upon the sort of daily life of Londoners that rather than start afresh with a new design of a cenotaph, he rebuilt the wooden cenotaph in stone and it's become an important focal point for national memorialization on November the 11th every year. So you can see on the right hand side here the, 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 the kind of um, what, what happens with the, the sort of um, addition of graffiti and so forth and different things onto these memorials. It, it's very very highly charged. Now I've mentioned that when we're looking at Trafalgar Square we're going to consider a case study of a statue that wasn't taken away, but a statue that was added. So just to refresh your memory here, we've got the Ministry of Defence there, we've got Whitehall, we've got Nelson himself on top of the column here. So Nelson, the naval hero. And at each corner of the square around him, there are four plinths. 
there is um, there are two generals on there, uh, generals Havelock and Napier. There is King George the Fourth, and there's a fourth plinth, an empty plinth that was going to have King William the Fourth on it, but it never got filled up after William the Fourth's death in 1837. So this plinth was left empty for a long, long time, and the over the years there have been many attempts to fill the plinth. And the agreement always was that the person who should be on the plinth ought to be, quote, a heroic figure who was in the kind of continuum of um, British national heroes. In recent years, the thinking has been to place a statue of either Margaret Thatcher there, Nelson Mandela has been mentioned, and also um, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, a hero of the Battle of Britain. And for many, many years, there was an issue about this empty plinth. And in the late 1990s, a committee came along and, and started to progressively put three installations on here. But it was this one, the, 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 within a sort of second series of um, installations, that caused a huge amount of controversy. And certainly by one of Air Vice Marshal Keith Park's um, relatives, who was very, very critical of this. This is a, a sculpture by um, Mark Quinn, called Alison Lapper Pregnant, um, made in 1999. And it was installed here from 2005 to 2007 on the empty plinth. And as I said, it was the addition of a statue rather than the removal of a statue that, that caused a huge amount of controversy. Um, you can Google this and you can have a look and you can look at the different news sources and you can understand from the different kind of political corners from where the different arguments were coming from. Um, and I give you there Alison Lapper's quote there about um, at least she didn't have to slay someone to, to get up there on the plinth. That statue was removed in 2007 and there, it's a whole cycle of statues have been put up there. Um, there's a statue up there at the moment. The thinking is, um, or the, 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 the idea is that ultimately this statue may be reserved for the present monarch after the present monarch dies, that this might be where her statue would go. But the, the idea of a contested space here, where there is no statue, just goes to show how important these things are. And statues are incredibly powerful things. And this leads us on to Nelson himself in Trafalgar Square. This is, a uh, Afua Hirsch wrote this um, uh, story in The Guardian in, back in 2017. And it relates, of course, to something that is kind of um, live as, as, a, as, as an idea at the moment. And the issue of Nelson and his links to slavery. Um, none of that's part of this discussion here. We're, we're, we're not dealing with the history of Nelson's links with slavery. We're, we're looking at the symbolism of his statue and the symbolism of his representation. Now, this was a, this was a comment piece, an opinion piece in The Guardian. It, it didn't incite um, any form of destruction. Um, it, it, it was a it was a what if scenario. It was really rooted in the sort of whole issue of what was going on with the Confederate uh, the Confederate statues in the Southern United States of America, and uh, and how we deal with this issue of a, a sort of a problematic heritage and a problematic past. But and again, this relates back to the how amazingly ideological charged all of this is, how problematic statues are, that this news got twisted and we're going to come back uh, to this issue very sort of towards the end of this talk here, where we'll be looking at uh, a, another issue that got twisted in popular imagination. This one did get twisted in popular imagination. It got twisted within media outlets and it was almost rewritten to suggest that English heritage were calling for the removal of Nelson's statue from Nelson's column. It could be far from the truth. Um, such was the outcry that in the end, you know, English heritage, and I've spoken to a number of people who were working at English heritage during this period, that the phone lines were in meltdown and the, the Twitter feeds were in meltdown. And it just goes to show that, you know, the, the, the issues of statues can be hugely contentious, but also the facts often get blown up, they get misinterpreted, and people get ideas into their heads that things are happening when they're really not happening. 
Um, and that's certainly the case here with Nelson's column. He's not the first Nelson to cause issues. Again, the power of the statue here, back in 1966, the 50th anniversary of the Easter uprising, the Irish rebellion, um, is, is interesting again, because this relates back to what we saw at the very beginning of this talk with Lenin turning into Darth Vader. Um, here, the IRA, the old IRA, um, basically blew up Nelson's pillar. Nelson was on top of it. This is in O'Connell Street um, in Dublin um, in 1966. As I say, it's the 50th anniversary of the, the um, Easter Uprising. It was a way of marking that event. It was a way of marking, in a sense, the, uh, the Republic of Ireland finding its own identity and the removal of colonial symbols. So here was a rather extreme example of iconoclasm, the, the dynamiting of Nelson's pillar um, and the destruction of um, British imperial symbols. But there's a lot one could write actually about the survival of British imperial symbols in former colonies. And certainly as you, you walk through Dublin today, you can still spot the old post boxes. You can spot the old telephone boxes. They might have a VR on or a GR on the front. They're not painted red, they're painted green. And that's kind of nice thinking through the adaptation of this um, cultural heritage um, and, a, and a reshaping of it. It all comes back down to as well, things like renaming streets, for example, um, and renaming buildings. So yeah, th th there's, a, there's a Nelson example close to home, but we can go a little bit further away here. And um, this is, uh, Barbados, and this is Bridgetown. Now, Barbados is in the news right now because um, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley has announced that it's her desire, it's the ruling party's desire for Barbados to become a, a republic um, in 2021, the 55th anniversary of Barbados's independence, um, and joined Dominica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Guyana as the, the Caribbean republics and the Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness is, is talking about the same thing. So there is, there is currently a very live debate now in Barbados about removing the Queen of, as head of state, but it is not new because, um, as I say, Guyana has been a republic for a long time, as has Trinidad and Tobago, and as has, has Dominica. So this is not a new thing, it's not a new phenomenon. But within the context of what's happening now, and certainly within the context of the Black Lives Matter debate, um, it's it's re-energized it. And for a long, long time, the statue of Lord Nelson in um, National Heroes Square, just outside the Parliament in Bridgetown, the Parliament building you can see here on the right-hand side with the, the Barbados flag flying on it, um, is, is a very live topic. It's all part of the decolonization process. Here, Nelson has been painted in the colors of the Barbadian flag blue and yellow, that explains the colour symbolism there, the graffiti's on there as well, the removal of, uh, of Nelson is something that many, many people have called for, um, and it is highly likely that Nelson will be quietly removed, but he's, he, it won't be thrown away, it'll probably end up in the Barbados Museum, or probably end up um, at the Pierhead, or somewhere like that, but it's the location that is important here, as with many statues, this is national hero square and the idea of national hero is a very strong caribbean phenomenon and relates to nation building as i said earlier you know nation building is an important part of all of this and and the, the confidence to find your own symbols um barbados along with a number of other caribbean countries they're having these discussions about the removal of symbols such as this and, and nelson again we've got we've got the muddying of the waters to some extent with the issue of of nelson and his relation to slave ownership and slave owners as well so so you can see here it's, it's quite contentious that there is still actually a strong local barbadian opinion that says well actually this is nothing to do with that this is to do with the fact that he essentially protected the caribbean from the french so there are lots of narratives at play here within this statue um, it's not just a statue of Lord Nelson. Again, as I'm saying, you've got to see the, the sort of social and historical context of all of this. That's really, really important. But to stay in Barbados and to stay with another statue, um, this is the sort of statue that we're finding that, that is starting to, to, to come up in the Caribbean countries and is being discussed. This is the emancipation statue of Bussa. Well, it, it might not be Bussa. 
at the um, at one of the roundabout sites outside Bridgetown. So as you drive in from Grantley Adams Airport, um, you encounter this. It's actually quite odd, really. One would have thought it ought to have been in National Heroes Square, but it's located on a uh, on a on a motorway roundabout outside Bridgetown. But importantly, it's actually visible then to visitors coming in from the airport. Um, and the statue commemorates uh, it's 1985 statue by Carl Brudhagen, who was a Guyanese um, sculptor who who worked extensively in Barbados. Um, it's a statue that is designed to commemorate the 1816 slave uprising. Barbados only had, it had one major, major slave uprising in 1816 and didn't have as many as places like Jamaica, for example, but it's seared on the, the sort of social memory of Barbados, this, this communal memory. And uh, the, the idea of this statue is to sort of show resistance and to emphasize slave resistance. And once a year, on the commemoration day, academics from the University of the West Indies, often dressed in West African um, robes, will come here and, and, and commemorate Busa. Um, and you can see here the, the very heroic pose, the breaking of the chains, all of that symbolism here. Um, the, the sculptor himself, actually, Brudhagen, didn't specify it was actually Busa, but in popular conception, it has taken the identity of Busa, the leader of the 1816 uprising, and it's become an important focal point. Now, I want to mention a very, very important study that was done on Caribbean statues, and not just Caribbean statues actually, but statues that commemorate the slave industry and, and, and the slave trade in the Caribbean. It was undertaken by Dr. Winston Fulgence, a St. Lucian national who was studying at the University of York. And, and Dr. Fulgence's um, PhD thesis that I really hope will, will, will be published soon is a very, very interesting cross-cultural study of commemoration of slavery. He uses a book by Richard Young called Textures of Memory as his starting off point. Now, Textures of Memory is not about slave statues, it's about Holocaust statues and Holocaust commemoration in Europe, in Israel and in North America. And, and Young's argument was that these statues mirror the social and historical context of um, where they're found. So an American Holocaust memorial will not be the same form, it will not be the same material as a German one or an Israeli one or a Polish one, for example. And, 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 and Winston Fulgence took that idea of looking at the, the situation of the statues within their own context and understanding what they say about places. Um, one of the it's not a complaint it, well, that's been raised, but one, uh, something that has been raised about the iconography of these statues in the Caribbean is that they, they're very male centric. They, they, they focus upon males and it's often active resistance here with Bussa actively breaking chains. Other slave memorials in Europe tend to focus more on a cross section of slave society such as females and children. And I think that's got, there's quite an interesting study that could be done here sort of to, to sort of develop Winston's ideas and context. He, he looked at statues in the um, American South and American North and in Europe that commemorate the slave trade and looked at, looked at how they worked. But, but slavery, is, slavery is sort of one of the key things that we'll be looking at here in this discussion, because as I've said in my summary for this um, talk, we're talking about the, the, the issues of Black Lives Matter and the destruction of statues now at the moment. But we'll, we'll keep on a sort of broader context too. I'm, I'm aware that we, we need to sort of see this the bigger picture. Here's a statue, or should I say a bust, that, that wasn't destroyed. It was, it was moved. Now this is Sir Hans Sloane. Hans Sloane was an 18th century Irish-born physician who lived in London. He had a large house in Bloomsbury. Um, he was one of these polymaths that one found in the 18th century who did lots of things, he traveled widely. He, he, he was especially, his, his main, if you like, income generator was as acting as a physician to planters in Jamaica. So he often went over to Jamaica and he collected lots and lots of stuff. He collected a huge sort of ethnographic collection, he collected antiquities, he collected books, and he ultimately had to move into a large mansion in Chelsea and we get the we get the identification of Sloan Square from him. When he died, he, he left his collection to the country um, on the stipulation that the country would pay uh, a pension to his his um, his, his successors. Um, and there was nowhere to put it, basically. So 
the, the British Museum came into being on the back of Hans Sloane's collection. And recently, as we see here with this tweet um, from the 24th of August here, the British Museum removed the bust of Hans Sloane from the, the front and made it less visible. The quote here is from Hartwig Fisher, who's the director of the British Museum on the 25th of August 2020. We've pushed him off his pedestal. We must not hide anything. Healing is knowledge. So the idea now is that this, this bust doesn't sort of float without context as it used to do. It will be contextualised with reference to a story of how he acquired his wealth and how thus he acquired all of his collection and how thus the British Museum acquired the starting points of its collection too. Um, yeah, okay. I'll point out to you, obviously, the, 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 the Twitter handle here is Save Our Statues, um, which, which shows, again, the sort of passions and the hundred and, or should I say, the 360 degree perspective of all of the arguments around statues and how politically contentious they are. Um, you know, th th this is a very much a live issue and it's not going to go away. Um, these are things we need to think about. I've mentioned the idea of nation building and nation recreation in statues. Um, in Bulgaria, in Sofia, in Bulgaria in 2011, the Red Army Memorial was um, defaced. Um, here, for example, the, uh, Ronald McDonald, Captain America and Superman were, were painted on the Red Army soldiers. Uh, the, the whole process of this is quite interesting too because I um, mean again Bulgaria was in the orbit of the former USSR it was a Warsaw Pact country and one of the ways of enforcing a communist ideology and to make communism very visible within the streets of places like Sofia and Warsaw um, and, uh, you know, and other Eastern European countries was to have memorials that related back to the, 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 the Red Army and the fight against the Nazis. And of course, the Russians were not very um, happy about this. Um, and it, it's been, it is problematic because here, this graffiti is actually from a, a right wing Bulgarian group and it's anti Semitic graffiti too. So, whereas the previous one might look at uh, you know, having a little bit of fun cocking a snook at. Uh, the Russians. This this one is sort of taking it a, to a, to a, to another level now. This is anti-Semitic graffiti from the Red Army War Memorial in Sofia in 2017. Um, so hugely problematic. A lot of emphasis has been placed upon what the Nazis did, or or should we say, how the the Nazi past in what would become Western East Germany was was kind of diffused. And it, it, it comes through a sort of a, a denazification process. There's a lot of debate at the moment in Germany about how one should deal with heritage sites that relate to the Nazi period. Nuremberg is a case in point. The Russians destroyed the, the Führer bunker in East Berlin because they were fearful it would become a focal point of neo-Nazi pilgrimage. There are other issues too with Berchtesgaden, for example, and, and other places associated with the Nazi party that if you keep these sites uh, as, as sites of memory and as sites that they're there to remind people of what went bad in the past, there's also the potential that they can attract pilgrims who, who share the same values uh, as the Nazis did. So it's been a, a huge important issue. The, the German scholar W.G. Seabolt, um, who came over to the University of East Anglia and spent the rest of his career at the University of East Anglia, was actually a, a scholar of English, but he, he wrote a lot about why the Second World War wasn't really, why people didn't take a grip of the Second World War in Germany. And whereas we've talked a lot about memorialization, what Siebold is leading us to think about is the process of forgetting as well, and how we can use heritage in a sense to forget and how to take things out. And this is the Citadel in Berlin and the Citadel contains, and this is important, not just Nazi period statuary, but also statuary relating to the 
DDR, East Germany, communist um, control of East Germany, and also, interesting enough, to Imperial Germany as well, and statues that relate to German colonization and Imperial Germany overseas from the 1880s to post-World War I, when the German colonies in Africa were removed. Um, so this is an interesting take, or sort of like, a, if you like, a, a warehouse of heritage, a uh, sort of place where the bad heritage, if you like, is placed. So it can still be visible, but the important thing is it's contextualised because in coming in to see this material, you are given the background, you are given the, the, the information that you need in order to understand it and place it within some form of historic context. Now, that doesn't always happen. And that's what is really, really good here, in a sense, is this important historical context. You may remember back in um, 2003, when the American forces arrived in Baghdad, the pictures of what was going on there in Baghdad, there with the toppling of the, the statue of Saddam Hussein and the debathization, if you like, of, 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 of Baghdad. Um, this memorial here was toppled, this, this statue here was toppled to him. Um, and a piece of him is finally sort of turned up on, um, on auction as well. So it just goes to show that, you know, the, 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 this, this idea of statues is, pulling down a statue is just not a simple act. There's a lot of huge context to it. Dealing with an imperial past is important too. Um, here we have Coronation Park in New Delhi in India. In Coronation Park, um, you've got essentially, a, a, as with the Citadel in Berlin, you've got uh, places where the old Raj statues go to die. This is King George V, the statue of King George V. Um, and the statue of King George V relates to the, the Durbars and the great imperial celebrations that were held in New Delhi. When India became independent in 1948, there was a lot of debate about what to do with statues and what to do with them and where to put them. And a, a number of them sort of hung around the streets, but a number of them were moved into Coronation Park where they are now and you can still see them. They're not prominent, they're not in, they're not in sort of central display, they're kind of, it's an overgrown park. But again, I think it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of important to see how other countries are, are sort of dealing with a past. Now, the issue of Confederacy is a very live one, um, and Confederate statues. There's a, a large number of these statues that were put up here in the southern United States for the Confederacy um, relate to important figures like Robert E. Lee, for example, and soldiers and memorials to Confederate soldiers, Confederate political figures, and so forth. And of course, they're very, very highly contentious. Um, the Confederacy is, is still, you know, 150 years, you know, after the end of the American Civil War. This is still a very, very um, difficult subject in the United States. So what we've got here then is, is an issue again of, of, of the power of statues and the power of defacing and removing statues and so forth. And what's interesting here is, uh, quite a, a really neat um, study that was undertaken by Ryan Best and there's the link here and the title of the, the, the study Confederate statues were never really about preserving history. This graph here shows the, the dedication periods uh, of when these statues um, were inaugurated and large numbers of them were basically sponsored by the Daughters of the Confederacy and in many cases one of the reasons why the statues tend to sort of fall so easily is because predominantly they were quite cheaply made. The Daughters of the Confederacy um, attempted to raise money so that every place could have a Confederate statue, um, but they didn't raise enough money. And if they did, the, the statues were built of very, very poor material. So we end up with these rather cheap statues. Now you can see here that it's, what, what Best has done is he's mapped the dedications of the Confederate statues to wider events. So for example, the Jim Crow laws um, and new equalities legislation. And very briefly in the 1960s, the issue of the um, um, desegregation of schools as well around 1960, which incidentally also sees a large number of schools within 
the southern United States being renamed after Confederate heroes too. So it's not just statues, it's also renaming that goes on here. And this is important because this is, this is what I'm talking about here, the idea that in order to see the, the importance of the statue, you understand its political context and you understand essentially what the wider issues are here. Um, and this is a nice little sort of neat sort of um, graph that, that shows this here. The, um, for example, here, the NAACP founded in 1909. Now that, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People was basically a, a way of giving African-Americans a voice for the first time in the Southern United States. And within the, the former Confederacy, the reaction by the by the predominantly white inhabitants is to is to produce more statues. So again, a really interesting study that looks at that sort of bigger picture. Lately, over the summer, we had our own um, issue here with the Edward Colston statue in Bristol. Now, whenever I've been to Bristol and seen this statue, there has always been some form of graffiti on it. There has always been uh, something there that has been left by the to, to, to show the, the contentious issues of Colston and, 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 and who he was. Um, it, it's interesting that, that Bristol, as many of you will know, has a huge sort of history around the slave trade, but there was very little sort of direct slave trade from Bristol. It was all the merchants of Bristol who got very wealthy through the slave trade. And Colston, was was part of this sort of process of, of of making that happen. He spent a lot of money on the civic um, kind of improvements of Bristol, and his statue actually dates from the 1890s. It it, it, it doesn't really. It, he died in the early 18th century, so this statue wasn't put up after he died, commemorating him as a slaver. It, it's a little bit different, actually. It's a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more complex. That in the 1890s. Um, a number of Bristol noteworthies tried to raise money for the statue of Colston um, and th they ran an appeal for a long time and, and the statue more kind of reflects late Victorian values of civic virtue and the fact that he was a philanthropist and he, 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 he made schools and concert halls and so forth and he endowed a lot of things going on. Um, it, it doesn't commemorate him as a slave trader but that's part of his biography. But what the Victorians were kind of doing was celebrating him as this sort of late Victorian example of civic virtue. And so we, we, we've, we've, we've got this here. But as I say, the, the, the appeal that was run in the 1890s, it took a long, long time to actually raise the money. And eventually they put the statue up um, and, uh, you know, um, it wasn't even paid for fully. Um, so it wasn't something that everyone was behind when it was first put up in the 1890s, I guess, is what we need to say. Um, the Historic England, um, this is the Historic England statement that came out after the removal of the, the statue. And it really reflects what the heritage industry basically was going to say about all of this. That the idea that there's been a big debate about it, that for many Bristolians, for many Bristolians from African Afro-Caribbean backgrounds, it was an uncomfortable thing to have in the middle of your city. Um, and what this statement says from Historic England is, uh, is, is basically you need to talk, you need to work out what's going to happen. And of course, you know, the unauthorised removal of the listed structure, well, that, that's actually very, very problematic. But it's going forward now is the important thing. That's the real issue. Um, and it's going to be a long and difficult discussion. His statue was obviously toppled and then it was taken down to the harbour and it was chucked into the harbour. And um, it was recovered a few days later and paint all on it. And the paint has been kept. And actually, as this tweet from Bristol City Council shows, there was, there was an attempt as well to preserve that moment of when the statue is toppled and the various meanings that are sort of wrapped up into it. Now, this is really, really important because one of the things that archeologists now talk about and heritage practitioners talk about is the idea of a biography of an object, an object biography. 
seeing the whole life story of a, of a statue. And this is really interesting because we've already started to do that with Colston. We've seen the Colston statue itself is not a product of Colston's time back in the early 18th century, late 17th century, early 18th century. No, it's a product of Victorian civic values of the 19th century and what Colston did for Bristol. That's, that's what it is. But then we see it acquiring a narrative as we move on through the 20th centuries. Bristol becomes a more multicultural place. It then becomes a symbol of, uh, of protest and resistance, particularly amongst um, Afro-Caribbeans and Africans in Bristol. And now, in, under the sort of recent events of Black Lives Matter, it becomes a focal point of protest. And the removal of the Colston statue and its dumping into the, 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 the harbour is, is again an important part of the biography of that statue. Now, the next thing that will happen to that statue is that it will, the, as far as I know, as far as I can gather, is that it won't be cleaned up. The paint that's been added to the statue is part of that biography of the statue, is, is part of the story of that statue. It will be placed probably within the M Shed Museum on Bristol Docks, and it will be kept there and it will be displayed and this is the crucial thing, in context, some of these placards will probably be there too. So it's, 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 it's really interesting. So we're going to see, this, this is how Colston is going to look now on display. This is, this is how you'll see him in the M shed. He'll be kept like this. Mark Quinn, who we met earlier in, in relation to the Alison Lapper statue, had a hand in trying to replace the statue here with the activist Jen Reed. Now, Jen Reed was one of the Black Lives Matters protesters and this statue was, was, was put up, it was raised on the plinth and um, it didn't last long, it was taken down again. But that statue will probably also come into the um, museum display as well. So again, it's, it's narratives, it's multiple narratives to help give the context to, to the act. Um, and, and this is the statement, this is the Twitter statement from the M Shed about what's going on here, about keeping the graffiti. Um, the symbolism of the graffiti is, has been preserved and its significance it has for us will be an important story to tell. Um, bicycle tire emerged from the harbour with a statue and also there was a magazine that was rolled up into the, the coattails as well. And that has the names of the people who fitted the statue. So what we have here is a wonderful sort of story of, of, of everything, the whole lot. All of the, the sort of context of that statue. Unfortunately, there was a reaction. Um, this is the grave of a, a slave called Scipio Africanus in Henbury Churchyard in Bristol. And um, a couple of days after the um, Colston statue was um, pulled down and dumped in the harbour, it was destroyed. Um, again, it shows the sort of huge symbolism of these statues. But finally, I, I'm just going to wrap up now. I mentioned sort of issue of when we looked at the Afua Hirsch article that suggested that it might be time to remove Nelson and how that got into mainstream um, kind of media. Uh, another sort of myth did the rounds recently that the, the statue of Jimi Hendrix in Seattle had been um, graffitied on by, I think it was, it was all lives matter activists, I think was, was the wording that was used. Um, this is nothing of the sort actually. Um, his, it was done by a couple of drunk students or something like that back in 2013. And it, it goes to show, doesn't it, how things can get retold and, and problems kind of can sort of get, you know, emerge where there weren't really any problems there to, to begin. Again, it comes down, doesn't it, to the power of the statue, the importance of statues. And I just want to leave you here with the, the ultimate discussion, if you like, the ultimate, the ultimate poem, Ozymandias, Shelley's Ozymandias of 1880 about statues. This one was a statue of Ramesses in, um, in Egypt, um, the statue that was set up to sort of proclaim the glory and the power of the king, Pharaoh, at the time, and how ephemeral and how quick it disappears and how quick it goes away. You know, statues don't tend to last a long time. They fall out of fashion, they get replaced. You know, in the Roman period, statues got taken down, they got altered, just reused, just for you know, the sake of you know, new architectural fragments and so forth. So th there are many different backstories to the destruction, removal, remodification of statues out there. 
But anyway, I've, I've gone on long enough. I want to try and squeeze in some time for some questions here. I see from the chat that I've got some. So um, Ellie, would you like to come back online, please? And um, sort some questions out for me? Absolutely, I would be more than welcome to. Right, so we'll go for the first one. And that is, why did the Hungarians set up a special park for the statues of the Warsaw Pact era leaders rather than dump them? Well, again, I know that it's, it's probably having had a look at the of what was going on in Germany and sort of understanding the fact that if you if you have statues there visible that people can see within a contextualized environment, that you can understand the experience better. If mm. you if you destroy a statue, if you throw away a statue, if you put a statue in a skip, or if you melt it down, get rid of it, uh, in, in a sense, an artifact. That, that helps make sense of a wider historical narrative has, has gone, hasn't it? And I think yeah. that's, I, mean, I don't know, to be honest, the Hungarian example too closely, but to me, that would appear to be the decision that, they, that they've consciously taken, as in the case of the Germans with Nazi statues and so forth, to kind of detoxify them, remove them from a, a kind of central place where they are visible and perhaps not properly interpretable, and being placed in a place where they can be contextualised. Okay, brilliant. But that's a supposition. That's my yeah, guess. Yeah, that's absolutely. And in some cases, that's all we can do. Uh, the second question comes in from Stephanie. And she's asked, related to the Alison Lapper statue and other modern statues, mm -hmm. are there recommendations for factors to consider for new statues? Does the sculpture, sculptor have free hand? Should someone be dead for at least a few years before the statue is made so people can dig around and find out their dirty laundry? Mm -hmm. and how are societies addressing these kinds of questions? Well, that's just a really good question. Um, I, guess, I guess that's a study that needs to be done, isn't it? Because one could one could have a look for example at um, plotting the the dates of the erection of statues in the victorian period against mm. sort of death and so forth and to see sort of the immediacy that these things were set up um were these people famous and were they did they then suddenly sort of did their star fade if you see what i mean and their statues mm. got removed and so forth and i think our attitudes to statues have changed since victorian times because um we are there's a different range of things that we use as statues, a different range of forms, different things that we commemorate. Um, Victorian statues arguably have a very a more narrower kind of commemorative basis. They tend to focus um, upon different themes than we do. It relates back to the study that Richard Young did on um, textures of memory and Holocaust um, commemoration. So that's, that's kind of interesting. In terms of another part that I understand from that question is the issue of impact of new statues on spaces where there are potentially other listed um, buildings. I mean, the plinth in Trafalgar Square, I'm not sure the listing status of it, but placing a statue on it is, is not a problem from the listing process or the listing policy point of view. Certainly the removal of statues is. The Colston statue was a listed statue, so, so that, was a, that was a policy problem. That was a, um, a, an issue that, that, that again, you know, historic England wouldn't like to see happen a lot really. Um, so, so statues, removal of statues, there would be an issue about having to apply for consent to remove them if they are listed. Yeah. There would certainly be planning issues around that too. There would certainly have to be a lot of dialogue about why would it be appropriate to remove statues. Um, there are individuals in, who have media figures shall we say without naming names very obvious figures within the last sort of 10 years it's come to light have not been all that they seemed and there has been a retrospective um, and very rapid removal of their names from for example hospital wards and also um, their memorials in cemeteries their own personal yeah. memorials in cemeteries too so so there, there are mechanisms for if you like removal of problematic um, statues um, on a number of different levels, from pulling them down during the course of a protest to a, a long and considered discussion. I'm, I'm not sure if does that sort of fully answer the question there, but um, it's an attempt to. It's a very, very, yeah. very, very good question. I think <laughs> one that you could really develop, actually, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's another fairly long one here from Joanna, um, but it follows the same sort of theme. Uh, 
when we take down statues which are contested how do we ensure that we aren't creating a space where the addition of a statue as with the Alison Lapper one provides further controversy how do we remove statues when contextualization isn't enough without creating further issues um, and she goes on to say not saying we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't take some some of these statues down just wondering how we go about it and uh, Kyle says, you know, do we take a two prong approach exploring the impact of the theme slash context of contemporary statues, which should be tackled as well as re-examining the past? Mm. <laughs> the, the, issue with, the issue with Alison Lapper was that a statue hadn't been taken down. There was no statue there in the first place. So it, it was the one that was set aside for William IV, but that never happened. So it was empty for mm. a long, long time. The, the issue with Alison Lapper was that it was the wider sighting and the wider context of that yeah. statue that was crucial because of the perception that it was a national hero square, Havelock Napier, George the um, George the Fourth, um, Nelson, and then as you go on down Whitehall, you've got a, a, a number of other military statues too, and that was sort of like the, that was the main sort of issue there, the contention that you were moving a very obvious modernist piece in that didn't relate to um, warfare or sort of historical figures in warfare and so forth. Um, and actually then, th that is that plinth has been left kind of as an open installation space. So the statues, re new statues appear there on a, on a very regular basis. The, uh, uh, Helen Philipson, I think, is the statue that's there at the moment, her statues that there at the moment. Mm. Um, there, there is a lot of material that sort of then you know, it's, it's a nice sort of display space in central London. But I mean, I think if you, you know, what goes on Colston's plinth, the answer is nothing, probably, except a piece of signage from historic England that relates to the circumstances around its removal. Um, information, context, I think that's what I've tried to get at in this talk, is the idea that you, you, you have to give context you have to give information and if colston ends up in a museum setting as opposed to back on his plinth you don't just put him at the entrance to the m shed without mm. any commentary um and scrub him up you yeah keep the graffiti on there you keep the paint on there and it, it's part of the ongoing biography of that statue yeah. and i think if you take a biography view of it, it, it it's really important um but the idea of replacing contentious statue with a contentious statue um it's all subjective isn't it yeah absolutely. it's all subjective yeah um Joanna's followed it up she kind of clarified a bit more possibly um it wasn't particularly about the lapis statue it's how we avoid empty space left by statues taken down becoming a situation like Lammers. you know how do we fill the spaces emptied by removed contested statues well my my, my question to that is why do we need to if if you have sign if, if there's signage up there that said well there used to be a statue here and this is what happened to it and you can go and find it now over here um it, it kind of doesn't close the circle but it but it, it it sort of gives it gives the interpret it gives the the person who is seeing that plinth that empty plinth it gives them the interpretive power it gives them the information it gives them the context to understand what has happened the absence is important you know, there is a there's a there's a huge range of new theoretical thinking now within heritage studies about absences, about empty places, about the issues of, of things not being there and how we deal with them. And, and, and is it is it important to replace? I mean, you know, on a very, very obvious level, you know, with, with, with issues of conservation practice and, and how one repairs ancient buildings, the idea that when you do this, the repairs have to be you, you have to um, catalogue them all and they have to be very recognisable. You have mm. to see where the old stuff ends and the modern stuff begins. It has to be reversible as well. So these are all sort of like wider heritage practices that we can bring to the idea of, uh, of these contested spaces, I think. Yeah, OK. Uh, Jade asks, do you think that removing statues can lose the parts of our heritage or lose parts of our heritage? Yeah, I think inevitably losing, losing anything um, mm. uh, is, is a loss of heritage. But I think the question you need to be asking is, is if that heritage is problematic to sectors of our society, what do we do with it? Um, and for example, Colston hasn't been lost. The, the issue that's been undertaken in Germany, for example, is interesting too. And I think, you know, we, we have a freedom, we're lucky that we have the freedom to go and 
protest like this and, and, and uh, undertake this. I mean, the criminal damage of these things is, is it's, it is illegal. And I'll be very clear about that. I, in my talk, that none of this is, is condoning it. But what I'm saying is it's all part and parcel of thousands and thousands of years worth of human behavior that ain't going to change in the future. So, yeah, although it, it would be regrettable, in a sense, this, this has happened all the time. And history is always being reinterpreted yeah. and rethought. Absolutely. A um, couple more then before we wrap this up. I've got Tom here with, uh, it's quite interesting that upon the removal of the Colston statue, there was immediate move to protect the Churchill statue in Westminster. Do you think that this relates to some kind of prior prioritisation of statues? And if so, why do you think it's valued more than others? The, the Churchill statue is interesting because that one, if you go back to the poll tax rights of 1990, and also a, a number of other subsequent rights. The, the Churchill statue always seems to get um, targeted. Um, it's very visible for a start. It's in, mm. it, it's in Parliament Square. It's very, very visible. And I'm guessing the issue is this, and it's only, what, it's only my interpretation of this, is that Churchill is a more immediate historical figure insofar as his, I know, his grandson's still alive, for example, his family, there are still families still alive that are very close to Churchill. There's still people alive who remember Churchill and knew him very closely. There are still people alive, for example, who lived through the Second World War, yeah. who, who see Churchill within a different context. So, so, so the individual Churchill has a, if you like, a, a different, embodies a different set of values, perhaps, than someone like Colston. Um, so it, it may be that, you know, the, the fact is that Churchill is, the, 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 again, the reinterpretation of Churchill of the character and his historical context to um, within the, the, his, his attitudes to India, for example, his attitudes to empire have, have made him a target. So for, for, for many people, he's, he's at once a kind of um, a, a very, very a hero figure and also a target for anti-racism protests. And it's, it's interesting because you can see how this, when this all played out recently, that there was a counter protest, a, a statue protection protest that was undertaken um, that um, sought to protect the statues. So it shows that, that that was a very, very loaded symbolic issue. I would, I would suggest that a number of people in Bristol merely shrugged their shoulders when the Colston statue was, um, was, was, was taken down because to be honest, there's no emotional investment or historical investment in him. He's an abstract. He's more of an abstract. Um, the Churchill statue isn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. I hadn't thought about it like that actually. And I hadn't thought about him being such a close figure in time. So that's actually a really interesting take. Um, I'm going to squish two questions together here. Yeah. So I've got Tom with, um, with context being key for understanding statues. Do you think we will see changes being made to statue, lo statue locations themselves, i.e. plaques and information boards? Or will we see major changes such as the removal or replacement of statues like the Colston statue? And what I'm going to throw on the end there, so don't forget anything, um, is Saul asking, how do you think statues will be chosen in the future? Um, should it be popular vote or agreed by the powers that be? Take that last one, actually, because we don't tend to do statues that much anymore. And I suspect as we, just to throw in a little theoretical curveball here and use mm. the P word, within a postmodernist or supermodern, supermodern, late capitalist context, it's very, very rare. We don't tend, we don't tend to see statuary around. Statuary is very much um, within the sort of context that we see it in our day-to-day -day lives now outside of churches and churchyards and so forth it, it's it's really a very sort of victorian it's a very strong victorian um edwardian and sort of 20th century phenomenon i suspect within the context of the 21st century we'll find other ways of memorializing people um, and that might actually be through digital means it might be yeah. through other creative means that we don't even know about yet so it may be that the con the concept of a physical statue such as it is might not be valid for the 21st century yeah so that's the last bit of that question the first bit was about just help me again ellie was um it was a few seconds 
Uh, it was with context being key for understanding yeah. statues. Will we see changes being made to statue locations themselves, plaques, information boards, um, or will we see major changes such as removal or replacement? Okay, right. Okay, so so yeah, with the context of new statuary in the twenty first century, I suspect that will be a, a, a sort of digital and it'll be a different way of doing things. But also, then the way that we deal with statues in the past will also change. It will also probably be very very heavily. Um, in terms of contextualising the information, there'll, there will be more debates going on. We've got the Roads Must Fall campaign. We've got, there are other contentious statues around in the UK. Mm. Um, and I think there'll be dialogue. And I think, I'm hoping it'll be dialogue. I'm hoping it's discussion. Um, and I'm hoping that if the statues are removed and taken away, that they are placed somewhere where they can be still seen as historical artifacts. But more yeah. importantly, they can be interpreted properly as well and the, the whole 360 degree story can be told as opposed yeah. to one angle okay brilliant um where's my next one uh do you think the colston statue would have been toppled earlier uh would have been toppled if an alternative narrative had been established earlier if i could speak <laughs> mm, that's a good question i think i think you probably would have done actually i mean i think I think it. I think it probably would have done um, still because it was still a. It was still a symbol. I, I suspect it probably had to happen. Yeah. I suspect. But that is a really good question. I mean, again, it's a bit counterfactual. But I, I, I think if you see, if you understand more the context of the statues, you might be less inclined to sort of. But then actually, the 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 the, the, the opposite might happen. That if you understand the context of the statues more, you might be more inclined to to yeah. do something about them. I don't know. Absolutely. Um, these are going to be my final three questions. I know I keep saying that, um, but I'm aware it's seven o'clock on a Sunday evening, um, and there's surely a roast dinner out there waiting for someone. Um, this one's from Ellie. As you said earlier, that some of the Holocaust memorials slash statues are set in the context of their country they are in. Would you say that some Holocaust memorials or statues and also other statues can be seen as nationalist due to this? For example, Tim Cole mentions that the Holocaust exhibit in the in IWM can be considered nationalist due to its context. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I haven't really looked into that one, to be honest. Mm. Um, and it's, I don't think, I, my reading of, of, of Young's Textures of Memory isn't so much hmm. nationalist in a sense. Um, it, it's more looking at the historical circumstance and the fact that, say, for example, uh, a Holocaust memorial in this country where we didn't have the direct experience of the Holocaust for our, our Jewish community here, and it didn't impact on us in the same way as, for example, what went on in Poland the the tone of the memorials the scale of the memorials and the the typology of the memorials the numbers of the memorials are going to be different um i mean you know someone like poland has one of the ultimate holocaust memorials in auschwitz yeah. um and a, a whole landscape of concentration camps let alone sites of massacres and ghettos and shtetls and synagogues and destroyed jewish graveyards so 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 i think it's just thinking through the experience, I think, and how that reflects, as opposed to, I don't see, I don't see the nationalism sort of so much in it, that sort of angle. Um, but again, this is the the discussion around the Imperial War Museum example is not something I've looked at. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's something for everyone to have a gander. I hadn't heard of that either, so that's good. Um, all right, last two. Has the permanence concept of statues outlived their purpose and should they be erected on a rolling cycle and invite discourse instead and reflect our transience and dif difference instead? And much to that, um, the Alice and Napa wonder, the continuous open mm, space, mm, I suppose. Mm. And that's from yeah. Sabina. Oh, that's from Sabina. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, um, I think I've sort of discussed that. I think that maybe the statuaries had its, had its chance for the 21st century. Uh, I think we, we need to be more open to different strategies of commemoration of individuals in public spaces, private spaces, in between spaces, um, and not just in physical form, in material form, in virtual form too. I think someone needs to write a postmodern approach to statuary. Brilliant. Well, there's a degree out there waiting. Um, and my final question of tonight, it comes from Stella. How would a heritage manner begin 
manager begin to navigate the complexities of various voices in a community demanding the removal and preservation of contested heritage? Mm, good question, Stella. Okay, I mean, I think I, I think the issue is that is having the discussions in the first place is is the, is the crucial mm. first step, and it is not. Yeah, you know, so it's not easy. It's not easy to get all the voices of different stakeholders together. It's, it's, it's difficult to get all of the voices. It's difficult to get all the opinions. It's difficult to, 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 to judge what's, what's, what's going on. But I think it's something that heritage managers are going to have to do more. Planning departments in towns and cities, um, whoever owns the statues as well. I mean, it's frequently municipalities own these things. and They often don't realise they've got something contentious on their hands until it's sort of too late. Um, so I, I would suggest it's it's something that should be facilitated through local planning departments and through discussions there, through museums. And also, I think it's something we could do more in schools as well. Perfect. Um, we're going to end it there. Thank you so much, Niall. This has been really, really interesting and, of course, very topical. Um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone who joined us tonight.